Hi, I'm Glenn Everett, Master of Machines. Join us as we visit Phil and check out two XU1 Tiranas with a point of difference. And then I get to take this angry little giant killer for a drive. And be sure to subscribe to our channel for more awesome content coming your way. So Phil, here's an XU1 with a bit of a twist. She's got some optional extras, I see. Yeah, like a NASCO, like grandpa building it, really. <laughs> it is. I mean, it's all open interest, isn't it? Age group for, for muscle cars. It wasn't just to hot them up. It was to have them in standard form as well. So we sort of thought, we just like the fact that we don't see them around. Mud flaps, you know, original wheels and little trims and sun visor under dash tray, spotlights. And keeping it at the original height, it just drives so smooth. It, it, it's just, you could drive around Australia. It's comfortable, it's reliable, it's predictable. We use this all the time. We take Jan out in it, have a cup of coffee, sit down in the water. And it's not the original car. Basically, all the ingredients were. I wrecked an original one years ago, and the body was really bad. I'm talking 25 years ago. You know, a dozen years back, we found a good body as a donor, and uh, here it is today. I notice you've even got the newspaper on the dash there, an old newspaper. Tell me about that. The newspaper wasn't something I searched for. It was um, Jan's, uh, Jan's parents, they collected the old newspapers and gave them to us one day. So I went through them and thought, oh, look at that, March 72 newspaper, the same month the car was made. <laughs> You've got to have that. And on the back of the newspaper, the ads for the cars, Red Hunt Holden, it's got a brand new HQ Statesman bike today, DeVille 350 cubic inch, $5,900. Oh, wow, <laughs> so, I would kill for that. <laughs> oh, you would. Phil, we've got a very angry LJ XU1 here, mate. Tell us about this car. I know a bit of history about it, but I'm going to let you tell the story. I do love it. <laughs> Yep, yep. Well, as you know, I've been talking a bit about the uh, standard cars. I like them standard. Well, this is this is the, the hotted up roadie. Like it's just you got the Webbers, your big camshaft, bit piggy to drive. Well, it was a road car right right through to its time. Even when I was racing it, and your dad, you know, way back, you went around the track with your dad, and and we put the Webbers on you. Guys encouraged me to go Group Two E club car racing. We did that, and then we went a bit of Group NC, and then I realised it was getting a bit serious. And I thought, ah. Oh, might build, a, might build another car, but we didn't end up doing it. But we've kept this thing all this time and it's still running today. And it's still, you get, still get that fix, still get that adrenaline. It's only the six, but she's hot there. She'll pull seven, seven and a half thousand and, and um, it, it goes all right. Tell us about the engine. It, it was called the Pig. Uh, the Pig, it's, it's just a flat tap at big camshaft thing. John Taverner built this engine and, and um, for Tony Diviak was drag racing back then. And uh, I think he's still doing it now, but he's got a 308 and the car that this had the six cylinder in. So it was a drag engine for drag the big engine. Engine. not a circuit. Drag, not a circuit, never a circuit. The huge, biggest camshaft, totally unorthodox what you do in circuit racing. And it is very slow out of corners, but then when it gets up, does it rev. Well, probably 20 odd years ago, I remember I was very lucky you gave me a drive of this car around Winton. I'll, I'll never forget it. The thing sent shivers down my spine at 8,000 RPM. You said, Glenn, yep. rev it up, and I did. Yep, yep, yep. And I remember <laughs> watching never, it come through the S's and, and you're just fanging <laughs> the bum around, you liked it. Well, I've got to be honest with you, Phil, I am in love with this car, and you did mention that I might be able to drive one of your collection, and I was sort of hoping it might be this one here, but it, would it be a little bit too grumpy on the, on the road for me to drive, or what are your thoughts there? It hasn't changed from Winton, mate. I think it's been 20 years. So we'll see if you're still sharp. I think I can dial into it. Go for it. Thanks, mate. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Let's drive this giant killer. the sound of the symphony of six big trumpets. Dumping in all that fuel, sucking in all that air, those Weber carbs. There's nothing quite like it. It is intoxicating. Sort of sounds like the world's gonna end. It's dramatic. In fact, that's probably the best word for it. Dramatic. And when it comes to the world ending, I do believe that the world would probably end for you if you were the car lined up beside this angry little Tirana. 
It'd take one mean machine to take this baby on, let me tell you. Let's slot it back and cock. Hear that music. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's what makes life worth living for me. Oh yeah. <laughs> There's just something about driving a little giant killer, isn't there? You know, the first thing I think of is the number one, Peter Brock, behind the wheel of one of these little machines back in 1972. He won his first Bathurst, made the car and himself iconic. And he certainly was, wasn't he? You know, you had Alamoff and his big almighty GTHO Phase 3, and that was a monster of a car. This little giant killer took that thing on in the wet at Bathurst and won. A time in history that'll never be forgotten. They say the name Tirana actually derived from the Aboriginal word to fly. They certainly did fly, didn't they? Now, Harry Firth was behind the XU1 project from the word go. Everyone was running their big banger V8s, except for Chrysler, of course. They had a very stout 265 Hemi. But instead of choosing the HG Monaro to race, Harry wanted a car that was light and nimble. With a potent little highly modified 202 six cylinder in the LJ model and the smaller engines in models beforehand, and the light weight of the car, they were a stout little piece of machinery. When it comes to endurance racing, and that's what most of the racing was back in those days, over long distances, you can't beat low overall vehicle mass. It's far better on brakes and tyres, and if you've got the right power to weight ratio, you've got a winning combination. Sure, on some of the larger tracks with longer straights like Bathurst, Phillip Island, Sandown and what have we, the big V8s, they did drive away a little bit. But give it about 10, 15 laps in, when those guys were running out of brakes and the pedal was on the floor, the little Tirana, Brock and Bond, they just come on honing in there and kick some serious butt. That's what I call an awesome all-round giant killing package. That music that those carburetors make, I want to hear it, and I want to hear it all the time. <laughs> it's good for the racetrack, but we've got to be a little bit careful on the road. But, you know, there's nothing wrong with a little squirt, is there? <laughs> oh, geez, it's just like medicine. It's a soother. Definitely a good soother for a headache. Might create one, too. <laughs> but I don't care, because I'm loving it. Now, back in the day in race trip, I have on good account from my friend Ian Tate, the legendary HDT mechanic, that these were making around about 240 horsepower at the flywheel. Now in a lightweight car that was somewhere around a thousand odd kilograms, that was a very stout package. This one here is making around about 260 to 270 horsepower. It's in a very similar specification. These days in historic racing they're making up around 330 horsepower with roller camshaft technology and what have we. Now that is insane power. The old six cylinder Holden engine dates back to around about the late 40s when it comes to design on the drawing board. So they're not a modern engine by any account. So they did an amazing job by extracting that sort of horsepower out of them back then and also in today's modern age. Still an incredible little engine and they send a shiver down your spine at high RPM. It's a feeling that I don't think I can get in any other type of engine platform. You know, Peter Brock was a legendary driver, one of the all-time greats in Australia, and a wonderful person as well. He was a, a people person and had a lot of fans, and he gave them the time of day. And to think that we're driving a car now that helped put him on the map and show his driving skills off, with the opportunity that Harry Firth gave him to join the Holden dealer team, it makes me feel good, all warm and fuzzy. I really hope that he's up there looking down on us saying, Glenn, you know what? I know the feeling. I know the feeling, mate.